Welcome to the Dairy News and Views podcast, a production of the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team. Our podcast covers current educational, research, and industry tools available for your operation to manage healthy cows and calves while producing the highest quality dairy products. Well, thanks for joining us today on Dairy News and Views from the ISU Dairy Team. I'm Jen Bentley, Northeast Iowa Dairy Field Specialist, and I'm here today with my colleague, Fred Hall, Northwest Iowa Dairy Field Specialist, as we discuss today's topic. So welcome back to the podcast, Fred. Well, I'm always glad to be here. Uh, Yesterday, coming back from Dubuque, I saw water in the bar ditch, and that was a good sign. Yeah, and I actually saw the sun this week too, so that was a good sign as well. So fitting for today's topic, we did invite our Northeast Iowa field agronomist, Josh Mickle, back to our podcast. Josh is also a part of our Extension Dairy team, and he helps serve our dairy producers with questions they may have on corn, soybeans, and forages. So welcome back to our podcast, Josh. Thanks, Jen and Fred, for inviting me back. I'm always happy to join you. So Josh, I was looking back at previous podcasts, and you were with us towards the end of April last year. We were discussing peak and getting ready for that first cutting alfalfa. And this year, I don't think we've even started probably even measuring those alfalfa stands. We're a little few weeks behind, right? Uh, Especially here in Northeast Iowa. And so we've certainly started off our spring season with maybe colder than normal temperatures, but some more moisture, which is good. But what are those implications on our growing season? Yeah, Jen, you're absolutely right. April was... uh definitely cooler than normal and we received above average rainfall throughout much of the state. I think on record this past April was the 10th coldest April that we did have. So definitely cooler than normal. Uh, The last two weeks in particular, we've seen average temperatures up to 10 degrees below normal and anywhere from uh, one and a half to two inches of rainfall. Like Fred was saying in Northwest Iowa, they're finally seeing uh, standing water in places they haven't seen for a long time. Um, in Northeast Iowa, they've been seeing up to around four to four and a half inches in some places. So we we definitely have the moisture. Now, the good thing is that does help relieve some of the drought stress in these areas, um, but it, it has had a pretty significant effect on our growing season so far. Uh, alfalfa fields and pastures have, have continued to green up. They, they look really nice as you drive by them, uh, but their growth has been very, very slow. Uh, and that's mostly due to just the, the cooler than normal temperatures. Now, thankfully, uh, we do have some warmer temperatures uh, coming up very shortly in the forecast. And I think that's really going to help a lot of those plants start growing pretty quickly here. There's probably some variation across the state on how producers are coming along with uh, planting oats, corn, and new seeding alfalfa. Can you give us a feel for the progress in both western Iowa and eastern Iowa? Yeah, Fred, there's there's definitely been some variation across the state. Uh, in northwest Iowa, west central, southwest, they, they haven't been quite as fortunate to get quite as much rain as, as the rest of the state, so they have been able to get the most oats planted so far. On the other hand, like I said, north central, northeast, eastern Iowa, uh, they've been uh, getting quite a bit of rain lately, so they just don't have as much oats in yet. Uh, across the state, though, I, I'd estimate we're probably around 65-70% of the oats have been planted so far. Now, compared to our five-year average this time, that is a little bit down. Uh, normally, we should be around 80-85% oats planted at this time. And of those 65-70%, I'd, I'd estimate we're probably around 20-25% of the oats have emerged so far. And most of those have been in the northwest and west central Iowa regions. Um, When it comes to alfalfa seedings, it's it's pretty much uh, rinse, lather, and repeat. Um, You know, the areas where they've been able to get oats in, northwest, west central Iowa, you know, those are the places they've been able to get some new alfalfa seedings in so far. I do expect that with, you know, some warming temperatures for hopefully a lot of those soils will dry out pretty quickly. Any oats or alfalfa that still needs to get put in should get put in here pretty quickly in the next week or two. And Josh, as we start to see things green up, like you said, we're going to be thinking about that upcoming first cutting alfalfa here. We typically use the measurement peak to help us measure that quality of that first cutting. And I know across the state, our extension specialists take those measurements and we kind of do a recording for a certain field, but walk us through what peak is and how, how we measure that. Peak stands for predictive equations of alfalfa quality. 
And that, that sounds like a big fancy name, but really it's, it's a simple tool that provides an estimate of the relative feed value quality for that, that first alfalfa cutting. Uh, we base it off the height of the plant and the veg vegetative stage of that alfalfa stand. So whether you know it's, it's early yet and we don't see any buds, um, or maybe we have a few buds, but no visible flowers, or if that stand has some open flowers out there in the field. Typically for high producing lactating dairy cows, we usually want to have a minimum RFV of around 150, but you also have to account for any harvest losses when you try to figure out these values. So uh, you'll lose 15 RFV points if you are chopping that alfalfa for haylage and around 25 RFV points if you uh, harvest it for dry hay. You'll want to harvest that alfalfa cutting that first one when those peak measurements have an RFV of around 165 to 175 depending on on how you're going to harvest it. Like Jen said, uh, there are field specialists, extension outreach field specialists around the state that are taking some measurements out there and the counties across the state. And on the ISU extension and outreach dairy team page, they have a website that explains more about peak, how to take measurements in your own alfalfa field. And they also have uh, that report where those uh, extension and outreach field specialists, you know, across the state have been putting in some of those observations to help help producers keep track of where where maybe they should be you know josh we had a, a 19 degree temperatures a eight or nine days ago held for probably depending upon your area five or six hours when we're walking out there today and evaluating those alfalfa stands what do we need to look for and then help us understand the difference between what winter kill looks like and what root rot looks like? Yeah, Fred, really, really good question. So let's start with uh, how to assess that alfalfa field for winter injury. For, for this, we need to factor in both the number of plants per square foot and also the age of that stand. So uh, obviously crown and, and root diseases can have a pretty major effect on stand reductions. Uh, so when we do assess those plants, we need to make sure we're checking for dead, dying, or diseased uh, crown and root issues. That, that means, you know, when we dig them up, we need to make sure that uh, we're splitting those roots open. We're looking to see if they're healthy or not. We, we need to kind of do some due, deal, some due diligence here and, and really pay close attention to how healthy those plants are. Uh, when assessing an alfalfa field, we, we want to wait until that spring regrowth is around three to four inches high. And then you're obviously going to select some random places throughout the field to do some stand counts, not right along the, the main road or right along the drive. Um, you want to make sure you do some pretty random places throughout the field to really get an accurate assessment. Uh, you want to dig up all those plants in a one foot square area. Again, looking at the crowns or looking at the buds, the roots to check for any unhealthy plants. Then you're going to take the number of healthy plants out there and factor how old that stand is. A first year seeding should have at least eight healthy plants per square foot. A second year stand should have around five or six healthy plants. A three year old stand should have around four to five. And a fourth year or older stand should have at least three to four. You know, if you think your stands are a little bit on the thinner side, there are some options out there. But just a reminder if, if you do have a thin stand, uh, we don't recommend trying to reseed back into alfalfa, into an established alfalfa stand because. Uh, you're you're going to run into some model toxicity issues, especially if it's a, a second year or older stand out there. Now, as we are doing the the drive by, a, a lot of farmers say, "Yeah, my field's greening up," but you really have to get out there because there may have been enough carbohydrate in uh, a root that has some rot in it, but it's just the plant don't know it's dead yet. Is that a good observation? Yeah, it can be. Um, and that's where you, you really need to, to get out there and, and do a pretty thorough job scouting because you could have some patches out there where, where maybe you do have a little bit of standing water. There might be a couple of low spots out there and, and alfalfa doesn't like to have wet feet. It, it really doesn't care for wet feet at all. And, and that can lead to some root issues pretty quickly. Now that hasn't been a, an issue in the in the past for the past couple of years because we've been on the drier side but you know thankfully we we are getting some rain now and we do have some pretty adequate soil moistures so that that could become an issue especially in some of the areas where uh you know we have been getting pretty persistent rains so that's that's a good point fred you know we've been talking about some of these first light 
issues with uh, the winter kill and the uh, rot issues. How about the alfalfa weevils? What do we need to be looking for and are they a concern? Yeah, al- alfalfa weevils could be a concern pretty quick here, especially where we do have some shorter than normal alfalfa fields this time of year. Uh, normally al- our alfalfa is quite a bit taller um, so those shorter plants are going to get stressed out quicker and easier if, if they do start to get some complications from alfalfa weevils. So normally we predict that alfalfa weevil eggs will typically hatch around 300 growing degree days. And a really good resource to, to keep track of that is actually on the uh, ISU Mesonet website. Uh, they have some really good apps on there to keep track of your growing, growing degree days and your heat units. And they actually have a, a brand new app on there where it actually keeps track of uh, some different common pests. And alfalfa weevil is one of those pests that they keep track of. Now in uh, Southern Iowa, uh, we hit 300 growing degree days here in the last couple of weeks. For most of Northern Iowa, especially with uh, the short term uh, forecast looking pretty warm here in the next week, we're, we're likely gonna hit 300 growing degree days in, in this next week. If the alfalfa is, is too short and you can't use a sweep net to check for larvae, uh, then the, the best thing you can do if you're out scouting is, is look for adults or larvae that are feeding on those terminal leaflets or just look for some feeding on any new growth. Now, uh, as a reminder, alfalfa weevil adults, are, they're small brown beetles that are about a quarter inch long. They have a really distinct long narrow stripe down their back. Typically what happens is those females will lay up to 25 eggs inside of an alfalfa stem. About two weeks later those eggs are going to hatch and then the larvae start feeding for about three to four weeks. Those larvae, those they're, they're really small, um, they're yellow green in color, they have a black head and a white stripe along the middle of their back. The feeding first appears as, as really small pinholes in the leaves, probably won't even notice it, but then unfortunately as those larvae do get bigger, their eating becomes more ferocious and, and pretty soon you'll see where they're eating, you know, the majority of those leaves, they just leave the veins. Um, so you get a pretty skeletalized leaf. It, it, you can tell pretty quickly when the feeding gets pretty bad. A heavily infested field is probably going to look frosted or almost kind of silver. Um, and that's mostly due to just all the dying plant material. It's, it's pretty easy to pick them out when it gets that bad. Recently, there has been a, an ISU ICM blog article here in the last couple of weeks that talks about how to scout for alfalfa weevils and how to determine economic thresholds based on the height of your alfalfa stand and current hay values. Now, one thing to also keep in mind that uh, this past fall, we had some pretty severe fall armyworm damage. Um, It was, it was, you know, patchy, it was scattered, but in places where they had it, it was probably pretty bad. So if, if you have one of those alfalfa fields that was damaged by fall armyworms, or, you know, you were impacted by drought last year, which many of us were, probably need to be a little more conservative with your economic thresholds. Just keep in mind that that alfalfa field's been stressed pretty, pretty hard, and, and, and it won't take very much to continue stressing it out. Now, managing alfalfa weevils can be done a couple different ways, depending on how far along that alfalfa field is. You can either take an early cutting or you can apply a foliar uh, insecticide. Now, taking an early cutting is is preferred if it can be done within a few days of reaching that economic threshold. And if that alfalfa stand is around 15, 16 inches tall. Fortunately, a lot of our fields right now are, are pretty short, like, like Jen mentioned. I mean, we're quite a bit shorter than we normally would be this time of year. The second option would be applying a foliar insecticide. If you need to do that, a lot of the pyethroids are, are pretty effective. Biggest thing with uh, spraying an insecticide is making sure that you read the label. That way you're aware of what those pre-harvest and pre-grazing intervals are so that way you know, okay, after I make this application, I know then, you know, how long I have to wait before I can take a cutting, okay? That's probably the one thing to really keep in mind when we're talking about pesticide applications. Now, have I seen some place where some of our traditional chemistries just aren't available? Checking the label is really going to be important. Yeah, Fred, unfortunately, we, we have lost a couple of those chemistries out there, um, especially when our with our pyethroids. Uh, the EPA did pull a couple, couple products off. You know, one of those pretty effective 
Um, there are still some other options out there. We still have some really good options. It's just we need to be a little more careful on, on what we're choosing. And we just need to really kind of take our time and, and, and be a little more selective instead of just, um, I tell people, instead of going with just a shotgun approach every time, maybe we can try to be a little more selective and let's pick a product that does a better job of, of targeting this specific pest. And, and that'll also help us in the long term with, with dealing with any potential uh, resistance issues down the road as well. Well, Josh, you brought a lot of great information as we get started here with our growing season. And I would guess that as soon as these warmer temperatures are here to stay, things are going to green up pretty quickly and things are going to be moving along. So um, I will include a lot of the information that you included here in a, in the show notes, like the link to the peak. You mentioned the Mesonet website. So we'll try to get that included there as well. So people can take a look at that. Any last take-home messages you want to share with our listeners as we conclude today? Yeah, uh, and, and you kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, I mean, our, keep in mind our, our forages have been growing pretty slow the last few weeks. I've been getting a lot of phone calls about uh, when, when are things going to take off and, and we're worried about how slow things are growing. Well, we, we have enough soil moisture now, um, even though I don't think anyone's going to complain about uh, the rain. I think we're all patiently waiting to get out there. Well, we, we have the rainfall now and uh, we'll soon have some warmer temperatures to help things get up and get going pretty quickly. Uh, unfortunately, that does also mean that some of those pests that have been sitting idle are also going to be arriving pretty quickly as well. So just be persistent, be aware of, of pests out there and, and make sure that we're also doing a, a good job scouting as well. Well, again, thanks for being on the podcast here today, Josh, and thanks for being back here again, Fred. You're welcome, Jen. You're welcome, Fred. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today and look forward to visiting with you on the next Dairy News and Views from ISU. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or combination inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu backslash diversity backslash ext.